half seven. Unless the questions run out before then. Won't make you ask questions. Wait, wait for the microphone, por favor. That way I don't have to repeat the question. You spoke about the error of those who follow um, free will doctrine. Yeah. There are a lot of people like that around us here. How would you respond to someone who would bring up a passage like in Isaiah where God speaks, I long to gather you under my wings, but you were unwilling? Well, that's true, isn't it? So uh, what God's expressing there, and there's different ways to approach that, is his genuineness to receive sinners. Um, and uh, sinners are always unwilling to come. Now, we get again the level between God's um, revealed will and God's decretive will. So we always must compare Scripture with Scripture. And so, um, but the, the fault of sinners is not that they were not elected. And this is a, a mistake that we can make in dealing with them. Um, the fault lies in them. They did not want to come. Now, we know they're incapable of doing so until he moves in them. But on the day of judgment, they have no excuse in that you didn't, um, uh, you didn't work in my heart. He says, well, I, I called you, didn't I? And you did not want to have me as your Savior and Lord and Master. So at the end of the day, responsibility lies with the sinner. Obligation is tied to nature which we, our natures, uh, we've come by um, righteously through the fall of Adam in whom we sinned. And so we're, we're responsible, and it's important that we uh, we'll preach that responsibility and bring a sinner to a place where he understands that um, I can't do anything. And then, by God's grace, he might cast himself on God. And also, as you talk to people about this, uh, and I've seen in one occasion in particular, I think I mentioned here in the past, but uh, as you're talking to someone who believes they contributed in some way to their salvation, you say, well, why do you pray that God would convert someone then? If it's all up to their will, and God's not going to trespass their free will, then there's no need to pray for them, because your theology says that God won't do that. Yes. Um, well, this isn't explicitly related to this weekend's topics, but as the time of Passover nears on the calendar, I sort of got to wondering, um, is there a time in history, a, a point, a moment, I guess, where we can identify the Old Covenant prescribed law as becoming invalid. And I sort of picture, you know, synagogues full of families who are doing what they thought was right, what they had been prescribed, right? Um, in the, you know, after this moment, it, it just suddenly became heresy. And, you know, perhaps, and I'm not referring to those who rejected Christ, who knew about him. I'm referring to, you know, just like today, there are those who, who don't know him, at, you know, because of ignorance. Um, is there sort of a moment at which, you know, we can think of maybe the tearing of the, the curtain or I don't know? Well, I think the tearing of the curtain is when he uh, accomplished the judicial payment of the sins of his people. That then opened up free access uh, to God, as the writer of the Hebrew says, uh, apart from any priestly factor. We all have direct access to him. The New Testament, you could say the church formally was inaugurated on the day of Pentecost. And so then Peter's uh, preaching from the prophecy of Joel uh, shows the great transition that then took place. So now the, the laws then, uh, and then Paul in Ephesians, for example, and Colossians will speak of the middle wall of petition being broken down and that Gentiles 
now are on equal footing with Jews in, in the church. So uh, the moral law, which is written on the hearts of all people, even though in distorted form, but Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 2 that conscience is a sufficient a standard of judgment for people to be cast into hell. Um, the moral law obviously continues with the new covenant promise, not only is it engraven on stones, but now in our regeneration, on our hearts, which means we've got, uh, as regenerate people, even a greater uh, ability to obey the law. The ceremonial law, which was always typical, uh, was then um, fulfilled in Christ and all that he did. And so with the tearing of the veil of the temple, and all the priestly laws then would have been annulled. And again, the book of Hebrews speaks to that. The judicial law will have various functions. The parts that governed Israel distinctly as a, uh, a nation of people, those would have been fulfilled. But when the confession speaks of uh, the equity of the law, uh, many of the judicial laws are to govern God's people, not simply God's nation. And so the principal equity is those laws would then continue. Can I answer your question? None of you young people have any questions? Oh, the young man in the back there. Uh, along those lines, uh, is, has that salvation always been by grace through faith for the entirety of man's existence. Do any of you children learn the children's catechism? How were the people in the Old Testament saved? By believing in a Savior to come. Now, you're so well, you're all learning the shorter catechism, and that's great. So that's even better. But um, ever since Genesis 3.15, there's been only but one way. Again, broad evangelicalism will say that uh, it was simply believing a promise that God would save his people. But uh, we've always believed, the Reformed have always believed and taught that uh, it was believing in the promised Savior. And he is increasingly revealed. Uh, as I mentioned uh, this morning, even the Trinity is not some new doctrine in the New Testament. Um, this is why there was no upheaval over that. I mean, they got upset with Jesus calling himself God, but none of the early Christians quibbled about uh, the Father, Son, and Spirit being the same in substance, equal in power and glory with, with the Father. So, uh, no, uh, the, uh, the saints of all who were saved have always believed in the Savior to come. And as we learned from Genesis 15, 6, it was always by grace, uh, the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the other young man in the back. Another young man, yes. Um, would you give us an update on Antioch, PCA, and how we can be praying for the congregation there? Thank you. Well, I think I did a bit of this last year. We started in the middle of COVID, uh, September of 2020, with uh, three couples, one single person, and... Uh, one of the couples had four children. Um, today, we're having about 69 in worship with uh, maybe, I don't know, 20-something communicant families. And half of that group in worship are children, much like here, uh, for which we thank God. We uh, are growing in joy. We just received about 14 new people, but they've been just wonderfully integrated because one of the things that we have relished is being a family. And you begin to wonder at what point now as new people come in, can you maintain that? Uh, at this point, the, the fellowship interaction has uh, been quite, quite good. We've had one adult baptism and profession 
He was converted before he came to us, but he's growing now by leaps and bounds. We baptized uh, his two boys. So we have not seen any conversions at this point simply from the world, but we've got a, a number of people that we're in contact with and are praying for. Our big need is uh, space. You know, you feel built guilty saying that when you've been given a church building and 10 acres and a historic cemetery, uh, but we're outgrowing what was given to us. And so we need, uh, we need better bathrooms. We have two uh, unisex bathrooms. So <laughs> we have a little fellowship hall that is probably the, maybe the size of one of the alcoves. Uh, we do have, so we have three Sunday school classes, a pre-school class that meets in the fellowship hall, and then a primary class and a middle school class. And when we do uh, a new members class, then the middle school class goes down to the man. Oh, also we're given a manse. Now we spent about $75,000 to modernize it. But so our, our big need is we're working on getting a kind of a, a site plan, an overall plan. There's a... So the, the building is, is long, and then um, the fellowship hall only takes up one half. And so we could actually, I don't think we'd have the money, but maybe a temporary building, or, or if we had the money, could expand out to that side with bathrooms and some uh, nursery or Sunday school space or whatever. But um, the people are great. Uh, we recognize that uh, those in, whose hearts God is at work will not be bothered by the facilities. It's not dissimilar when I helped start Covenant Community OPC. Uh, had a bit more space, but it, was, it still was very difficult. And uh, God blessed there, and God is blessing us. But do pray for us. And then elders. So we, uh, we might have one man that is uh, with us that uh, could be an elder. We're starting leadership training, which will have a track in it of officer training. We've got some, a couple of men at least that would be excellent deacons, but you can't have deacons without elders. Their function is deacons, and that's good. And we have a six, about six interns, two of which will be graduating, and they, one already has a call. The other one is candidating up in New Jersey. He came from there as a great burden to, to return there to, to New Jersey. Thank you. It seems that the answer to most of the things that we deal with, and it's not just this conference, return back to the means of grace. It has to do with wisdom, it has to do with our life, it has to do with salvation, sanctification. Um, as, as we see the church moving further and further away, from attention to the ordinary means of grace. I especially appreciate that term, ordinary means of grace. And it tries to focus on charisma and other things. How, how can we speak lovingly to our brothers and sisters in other churches and those who profess Christ and point them back to the, the priority of those means? Uh, we were talking about that uh, maybe at the break today with somebody. I think the best thing we can do is um, the use of literature. You've got all the RHB pamphlets that most people read, a 34-page uh, pamphlet. Um, to put literature into serious Christians' hands so that they can begin to get a taste that there's something more than uh, how they have defined uh, church life. Um, obviously, we pray for them. We pray for the churches around us, and then we pray for meaningful contacts with those people. Uh, one of the things that I, I saw at this, the last uh, PCA assembly was suddenly there was this group of young men under 40 
speaking correctly to all the issues. And they weren't rainbow men. That was the first. In fact, there was no real need for our men to speak. So where do these men come from? As I met them and started asking questions, you know, well, I was, I was a Baptist. I was a charismatic. Um, I began to read this book. Or I listened to these uh, sermons. And uh, they not just become reformed, but they've become what we would say old school, normal means of grace pastors. And they're going back to their churches now. And if they're teaching the way that they were behaving at the General Assembly, that is very encouraging to me. But again, so is there the, the spirit sovereignty in their pilgrimage? And there was so many, are so many different stories. And so we pray and we interact with people, questions, you know, uh, you talk to a friend, you know, what do you think worship is about? Uh, what do you think is necessary to grow as a Christian? Uh, Get your questions put together and then have something to give them after you talk. Well, read this. Tell me what you think about it. Some way with ultimate questions, you're talking to a non-Christian. You know, read this. Tell me what you think about it. So I think it's a, it's a long process. And, and it all depends on those relationships that, that we have. Uh, can we mentor people? Uh, and we can. Um, just we need to invest in people. And... Uh, Prayerfully seek then to speak into their lives. That's, there's no great weight of wisdom in any of that answer. <laughs> I don't know anything else to do, though. Uh, some of you already have Bible studies at work. I think of when the Haldane brothers went to Geneva. I forget which one it was. Was it Robert? And by that point, the College of Geneva had become liberal. And he started having a Bible study. In fact, his commentary on Romans is the product of that, a Bible study in his apartment. And uh, people like Merle Daubigny and uh, other, the Monod brothers were all converted <laughs> and had a whole new generation then of uh, vibrant spiritual Calvinist. And so, again, those things, if, if you can you know, do a neighborhood Bible study or Bible study at work or something, that um, that's another, another option. And obviously today we have so many resources with uh, not just the reading, but then with uh, online messages and sermons that we can encourage people to listen to as well. And stream your own, I know you're streaming your own services, and I think we all learned through COVID how God uh, can use that in those who are in uh, weak churches. If they start hearing something that is that genuine and they've not heard before, um, well, what we've seen in Greenville is they've come to the Reformed churches. Well, Jacob had his hand up. You you want to you want to wait a second or not? Go ahead. So Romans eight states that the trials of the current times are of no comparison to the glory to come. Now, with this verse in mind, you mentioned the other day of certain um, modern events, as all events are. God is using to benefit his church. For example, the illegals into the country being converted and brought into the church. Now, personally, I would have never figured that out. So my question is, how or what... I didn't say that would happen. Pardon? I said you should pray it would happen. Yes, sir. So how or what should we contrast the current times with to understand how certain things may be used for the glory of God's kingdom? Now, understand we cannot understand the will of God. But how can we 
understand how the current times will be used for the glory of God. Well, we can think of three epics in history. Uh, you remember Machen mentioned the paganism of uh, the early church. And it was the church faithfully, uh, in spite of persecution, preaching the gospel uh, in all the places they went and suffering for Christ that uh, basically the world was turned upside down. And there was, in Europe, uh, a, a growing Christian church. When Constantine legalized the church, that in one sense was nice to have a respite from the persecution, but it also led to, to great difficulties. And then you learn a lesson as well, and that is uh, state-sanctioned churches are always going to be problematic. <laughs> Uh, but then we get to the Middle Ages, and that's where I mentioned the early Middle Ages with the barbarians coming into Rome, um, or not just Rome, destroying the Roman Empire. Um, they were converted. One of the greatest uh, emperors of what seventh century was Charlemagne. His court theologian is one of the best early medieval theologians, Al Kuhn. Charlemagne actually resisted the Nicene uh, promotion of uh, images of God in Christ. <laughs> he kind of stood alone uh, with regard to that. But uh, he had been covered out of paganism. And uh, so many of those uh, barbarians were converted. And in that, there was then a preservation of uh, Christian culture. With all the difficulties that were involved, particularly in later monasticism, early monasticism was something else that God used um, uh, to uh, promote and preserve uh, biblical Christianity. And then, of course, the Reformation. Again, uh, a time now where the church had become uh, much more full of superstition and works righteousness that uh, God sovereignly raised up men. And it's important to understand that this was more simultaneous. It wasn't everybody started reading Luther. John Collett was preaching out of Romans. He was the, the dean of uh, St. Paul's. He was teaching justification by faith alone. Zwingli was preaching justification by faith alone. Luther was preaching justification by faith alone. So God was sovereignly working, and that's another lesson we can learn. Behind the scenes, we don't know what God is doing in times like ours. And then, of course, um, revivals. Reformation was a revival. Pentecost was a revival. Uh, the First Great Awakening in particular, uh, both uh, in Britain and here, uh, did much then to turn back uh, deism and unbelief uh, and wickedness. Uh, for a time in the culture. So these are, you know, we don't know what God's doing behind the scenes. Now, Pastor. Thank you. You're welcome. As we pray for you. And uh, thank you very much for letting me come back. All right, we're dismissed. All right, boys, my helpers, let's go get these books put away and into the car.